Welcome to Around Town featuring what's happening here in the greater Concord area. I'm your host, Dick Patton. It's a pleasure to welcome you back as we come toward the middle of April, but actually marching toward the end of April and getting ready for May and all the patriotism that starts into the patriotic season with armed forces and Memorial Day. And of course, you can't forget Mother's Day in there, so make sure you get your Mother's Day cards. And of course, before I forget it, I want to wish a happy Easter to all my Orthodox friends because the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox all have their Easter coming up on May 1st, I believe. And also, too, a happy Passover to all my Jewish, my best friend who is Jewish and celebrating the season, and also State Representative Alan Cohen, who is also observing Passover. So. We've already had our Easter, but they get the leftovers, I guess, on the, on the Orthodox. But in that in mind, we're back in Tis the Season, and that's Tis the Season for Politics. And uh, with me today is Colin Van Osteren, who is a current executive counselor for the governor. He is also a candidate for the office of governor from the Democratic Party. And he represents the Concord area here on... The governor's council in his district is nuts, as far as I can see. <laughs> My gosh. From what it used to be, now he's almost like he's worse than Santa Claus traveling around the state with his district. But well, welcome to Around Town, finally. Thanks it's nice for to have me. you here. I'm happy to be on. Thanks well, for having me. Well, I'm happy you are too. Good. So, and I'm really happy that you are running for governor. And I think, you know, that it, you, you're coming in at a good time. And, some challenges ahead of you, though. I don't yes. know. You've got, what, two or three so far that are running from the Democrat side. But how, how are you doing with fundraising? Are you getting the money you're going to need to? It's going well. Uh, you know, the way we're doing it is relying on everyday people all across New Hampshire to pitch in. Some people pitch in a dollar and some people pitch in $50 or $100. Everyone can do a different oh, yeah, amount. Oh, sure. Um, but I think that's important because ultimately that also means that, um, you know, the people I'm accountable to in this campaign are not the powerful special interests. It's the people no. in New Hampshire. And uh, I think that's important. I think usually New Hampshire works best when we have a governor who's close to the people. Exactly. Uh, and uh, that certainly is the case for me. Uh, uh, I'm excited about the race. It's been going well. I'm spending a lot of time on the road, driving back and forth and up and down the state uh, and talking with people about both the big opportunities we have coming up and some of the big challenges that we have too. What do you see as some of your challenges? Now I know the the no, I hate to say North Country because in the Grange we always they 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 detest that word North Country. They lo I call it the Northern Sector, and they seem to like that better. But mm. the Northern part of the state has always been hit hard up there. Of course, they have the two prisons up there, which has brought some industry back there. But of course, yeah. they lost the mills which was always their big livelihood up in Berlin and Gorham, that area, Groveton. But that must be a lot of questioning you must be getting. How are you going to bring some more jobs up there? Yeah. It definitely is one of the areas of the state that we've had some of the biggest economic challenges. Mm. You know, I worked for Jean Shaheen when the mill shut down in 2001, and she was very engaged in trying to keep them open, did for a few years, trying to keep as many jobs as we could. Uh, and there have been some additional industries that come in, biomass and the prisons that you mentioned. I went out and I toured the uh, state prison with Senator Jeff Woodburn a few months ago and spent most of the afternoon talking with uh, the warden and corrections officers and inmates and hearing from mm. them about what's going on in their lives and uh, their families. Mm. Uh, I, it was very powerful, actually. I talked with a few inmates who were, they would read stories to their kids uh, and record them and mm. then s s mail a compact disc to their kids so yeah. that they could hear their sure. fathers reading a book to them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's hard stuff. Um, and, and we have to have an economy that's not just based around a state and a federal prison. Those are good employers, but we need a lot more than that. There's been one project which has uh, been going on for a while to try to get the balsams rebuilt. Yes. Uh, yes. My wife and I actually got married there. Did you really? Before it, uh, before it closed down. Her family's from the North Country. Uh, and I figure it's fine to say, as long as it's really north of the notch, I feel comfortable calling it the North what Country. What town in the North Country? Uh, she was born in Littleton, at the Littleton Hospital. Really? Yeah. 
And uh, her mom grew up in Littleton, uh, and they have a place in Franconia now. Oh, really? Right near the base of oh, Cannon interesting, Mountain. Interesting, because my so. wife is from the North. She was born up in Woodsville. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. Yeah. Woodsville. It's a beautiful part of the state. I, it is. I, I love the northern part of our state. I spend a <laughs> lot of time up there. Um, I think there are projects like getting the balsams up and running again, like trying to get more internet in more rural parts oh. of the state. The truth is, if you live without a good internet connection in 2016, it's like living without electricity. Oh yeah, 20 or 30 yes. years ago. Oh yes, it, you can't uh, you can't participate in the economy in the same way. Um, you know, I I found this really fascinating. So I have been working recently with Southern New Hampshire University. I worked there. I helped start a college that focuses on workforce development. We partner with employers. Mm. So our typical student is someone who usually has a high school education, maybe in her late 30s, early 40s, wants to get an associate's degree. And we partnered with a really big company, Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Oh, yes. uh, they have hundreds of employees in New Hampshire, 55,000 employees across the country. And we partnered with them to help get employees a college degree. And they told us one out of every three of their employees works from home. Hmm. So 55,000 employees nationally, one out of three works from home. Because they found it doesn't make sense to have a expensive building for a call center if they can buy a computer to go in someone's house and a telephone line and have them do all their operations that way but if you live in a rural area that doesn't have internet and a broadband internet then you're not going to be able to apply for a job like that if you're trying to start a business in your home you're not going to be able to have an e-commerce site um, so i think there are things like that that in rural areas in particular we need to do more well, the farming up there has really hurt because a lot of the farms have had to sell out. Mm -hmm. So the, the farming industry up here has really took a hit. Um, yes, you still have your maple syrup growers or the, uh, the Christmas tree farmers up there. But basically, I mean, when I went up, I had to go to Pittsburgh one day for a Grange function up there to present some awards. And I, I, it was amazing. Once I got past Lancaster, there was mm -hmm. nothing for a service up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sad because you're right. People basically up in the northern sector are living back about 40, 50 years ago in some cases. Well, there are some you exceptions know? to that. There, are, I mean, Littleton has been doing Littleton extraordinarily Town. well. Oh. You walk down downtown Littleton, walk down Main Street, mm. and most cities in New Hampshire would be envious of the stores and restaurants and businesses that have started. We had an event for my campaign. Uh, you know, we... We go around and we do house parties and meet mm. and greets. And we did one at Schilling Beer, a brewery in Littleton. It's right below Main Street, right yep. down by the river there. Yep. Uh, and it was great. Great crowd of oh, people. It's a nice place. Great new company. They're doing good work. They're prospering. They're doing well. Um, so I think there are certainly there are signs of hope um, in terms of how our economy can do. And um, I think a company like that could grow even bigger than it has. Um, but, it, you know, we have to have people in government who are looking out for the people of the state. Uh, it's easy in Concord, you know, all the powerful interests have big enough voices already. Hmm. It's hard, you know, you're in the state house. It's not hard to hear oh, yeah. uh, that. But we need people in office who are going to be standing up for the people. Uh, and that, you know, that's where I come from. That's my life. That's kind of sure. how I approach the job. So have uh, you been asked to take the pledge of no taxes and all that in your campaign? I have. I've taken the pledge. I, uh, the reality is, you know, I don't support an income tax or a sales tax, and no. I want to be honest with people yeah. about it. Um, I expect and respect that some people disagree with me on that, and that's okay. You know, we're a democracy. We can disagree on issues. Sure. Uh, but I think when you're opposed to something, you should be upfront about it. And mm. There are a lot of other issues where I've been very clear uh, about what my views are, and that's going to be true on that issue as well. I mean, I was talking with someone recently, and I said, you know, we, they say New Hampshire's a tax-free state. We've got so many taxes now, it's not funny. <laughs> really, think about it, they're calling. We, we are really, so many taxes, like either the, the uh, business profits tax or the, um, the, the property taxes. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's just nuts how it's going on out there, but you know, we've got to bring some industry back in here, like, especially the manufacturing, but where are you going to get it from? You know, it's you know, tough. I, I think it is in everyone's interest in New Hampshire to try to keep taxes low overall. Oh, yes. And, you know, that's good for 
all of us who are paying our bills and checking our bank account and feeling the pinch. Um, and it's good for companies too, who want to move here, or grow more jobs here. You also have to balance that with making the smart investments you need to grow your economy. Mm. And there are some things that you can do that achieve both those goals, helps you keep taxes low and grow the economy. So mm. there are things like Medicaid expansion that I know a lot of folks in the house have been working on yeah. for the last few years. You know, when we expanded Medicaid in our state, uh, 50,000 people now have health care that didn't have it a few years ago. Oh, sure. And that didn't, no one's taxes went up to do that. No, no one's state taxes went up. Uh, it's just that we had already sent a lot of money down to Washington and we needed to bring it back to put it to work for us here in New Hampshire. Mm. And that's an example where, you know, now that we have expanded Medicaid, I heard two amazing statistics recently. One is that last year, uh, 29% fewer people showed up uninsured in our emergency rooms. And it's not that people aren't getting a broken leg anymore or getting sick anymore. It's that when those things happen, they have health care coverage. Sure. And the difference is then when they show up in the ER and they've got a broken leg, but they have health care coverage, instead of those costs being passed on to everyone else, yep. they have coverage that's going to help pay for it. Sure. Uh, and that is a perfect example of how we can strengthen our economy, slow down the rise of health care costs, mm. but do it without passing some new tax that's going to burden everybody mm. a lot more. I know it because some people have criticized Obamacare or whatever, but yet there are some of them who now have some insurance, yes. health insurance. Yeah. And it is sad because they say, well, the hospitals can't turn you down or whatever. But you know something? I've seen sometimes that if someone walks in and they don't have the coverage, they, yeah, they'll get service, but it's like they're away at the end. Unless they come in by ambulance, but... Well, it, it also, you know, our hospitals end up spending a lot of money mm. on folks who come in with an emergency who don't have care. Sure. And it's, you know, that somebody pays those bills. Of course they do. At the end yeah. of the day, someone's paying for That's that. That's right. And so I would rather, if we've already paid for it by the taxes we send to Washington, let's at least use that money to pay for it, rather than paying for it twice, that we send the money to Washington, don't mm. get it back, and then pay all over again when somebody gets sick or gets hurt um, so there are things like that that can move our economy forward now you i think more so than some of the other candidates because you're on the council but you must have heard a lot about northern pass and the gas line because mm -hmm. we had a big grange conference saturday in laconia and those two items came up yes. because i admitted i'm not I'm not all that familiar with the gas line because I know it doesn't come into Concord, but it's going from the west side yep. down to the south. But Northern Pass is a big issue. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? So uh, I represent one town that's impacted by the Kinder Morgan pipeline directly. That's the town of Winchester. Mm, yep. It's one of the 11 towns on the route. You probably know Jim Tetro, mm. who's very involved in the Grange. Oh, and, yes. He's... Um, he's very involved in the town of Winchester as well. Yep. Yep. Um, I have a lot of concerns. I haven't supported what they have proposed. Um, and I'm not going to unless they answer all the questions that I and others have had about it. Sure. Uh, but some of the questions are basic ones. If you draw a line from Pennsylvania, where the gas is fracked out of the ground, to Drake in Massachusetts, mm. where they want to finish it, sure, uh, that line doesn't come through New Hampshire. You know, I mean, just think about a map. Yeah. And yet the pipeline does. Yes. And, I, you know, I'm concerned that sometimes people treat New Hampshire like a bunch of two-bit oh, yeah. local yokels. Well, and they figure if they're a powerful enough corporation that they mm. can do what they want. And... I think the people in New Hampshire should have a say over our state. Of course they should. And uh, so, you know, I have some other concerns about that as well. Um, frankly, there are other pipeline projects that already exist. Their pipes are in the ground, mm. and it's just a matter of them expanding the size a little bit. Sure. That would have far less environmental damage yeah. than building a whole new pipeline. Sure. So I think we should weigh all of these things together, not just one on their own. Um, you know, Northern Pass, if they if they bury the whole thing, I'd have no problem with it. Yeah. Uh, and the first proposal, they said they were going to bury one mile. The yeah. second proposal, 11 miles. The third was 60 miles. Yeah, I thought, I okay, that. you're starting to move in the right yeah. direction. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think, uh, I think we have to take our tourism economy seriously uh, and realize that, um, you know, there are special places that millions of people come to see every year in the state. But that also... 
Uh, we also need to acknowledge that the more we can do to bring clean renewable energy to the state, the better. So mm. I've been a big supporter of solar projects yep. around the state. Mm. Um, there are, when I used to work at Stonyfield Yogurt, before I was there, they put a solar array on the roof of the yogurt plant. Mm. And at the time, it was the biggest one in the state of New Hampshire. Really? Uh, it, this was about 10 years ago. It was 47 kilowatts. And now, a few months ago, the town of Peterborough just flipped the switch on what is now the biggest array in the state of New Hampshire, which is 950 kilowatts, almost 20 times as big. Uh, and that's because the price has gotten so much cheaper. Technology has gotten better and better. Mm. And I think what we'll see in the years ahead are projects that can produce 20 times or 30 times or 100 times as much energy as that big one we just turned on in Peterborough. Mm. And I'd like to see more of that kind of investment because it means local jobs, uh, it's clean energy. You know, technology, fuel always gets harder to find and more expensive and more dangerous to oh, get. Yeah, sure. But technology always gets better and better. And so I, I really am a believer in technologies where we should be looking for our investments for energy. And things like conservation, you know, uh, weatherizing a house isn't very exciting compared to, you know, a new transmission line. Mm. But the truth is, it's usually a more efficient way to spend a few dollars and cut your heating bill or cut your energy bill than building a new power plant is. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that that sort of, you know, conservation and efficiency goes a long way. So you're the Northern Pass, right, with, for me anyway, in, in this district that I represent. It's coming right through. You, I don't, you must be familiar with McKenna's purchases yep. over here. Well, the map that I saw back a few years ago when the, when the residents over there were really up in arms, it, some of it was coming right up to someone's back doorstep. And that's what got them all charged up because it was coming right through there. And I don't blame them. I said, no, I wouldn't want that on my doorstep. Yeah. But so I'm not sure if they they're going to be able to get them to move it or what's going on with that. Well, part of what they have to do, you know, you have these big companies need to listen to the people, That's even right. if the people aren't that powerful. Mm. They're still people. That's right. And one of the things that frustrated me along the way with Northern Pass is when they came out with the most recent proposal, they said, well, we buried the parts where we heard people want it to be buried. Yeah. The truth is people in Concord had asked for it to be buried as well. I mean, mm. we had a, a task force within the city council that yeah. looked at it specifically and mm. said they had concerns and wanted to see if we could bury it where sure. lots and lots of people would be being impacted. Mm. And I don't think the company had either realized that or paid enough uh, respect to those sure. concerns. Sure. Um, you know, I'm hoping that they do a better job of that, yeah. to be honest, because... You know, what I want a situation is where we can win together. But oh, I don't yes. think you can win by trampling on people's individual rights. No, you can't. But I don't know. It's really... And of course, too, now with the Rockingham racetrack becoming history or whatever, yeah. you've lost that somewhat down there. So, and then I don't see a casino coming into New Hampshire to raise money. Yeah. I think by with Massachusetts building three of them down there, and one of them not too far from our state line... Where's New Hampshire going to go? Really? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's a waste now. Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, part of this is just an economics yeah. decision. Mm. I mean, I play poker a couple times a year with oh, yeah. friends. Well. I have no moral objection to gambling. If people want to gamble, that's fine with me. But I think we also need to recognize that when, you have, when you're have when you building a $1.5 billion casino, mm. you know, a stone throw over the southern border... Well, if we build one on this side, we're just not going to make that much money no, off of it. No, I don't think so. And that we need to be honest with ourselves that there may be some costs. And, mm. you know, I think five years ago, there was a stronger case to oh, be made yes. for it. But, I do too. you know, this is 2016. Here's what I think we should be looking at to drive our economy. We need to be looking at passenger rail. We need to be looking at solar projects. We need to be looking at cutting the cost of college in New Hampshire. So when people graduate, they're not suffering from 30 or 40 or $50,000 worth <sighs> of debt. Yeah. I mean, you know, our young people now leave New Hampshire when they graduate yes, they from do. high school faster than any state other than New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, and when they're going off to college and when they graduate with debt, they are uh, buying homes later in life. They're getting married later. They're starting businesses less often. Mm. Uh, that isn't just a problem for those families. That's a problem for the whole economy. Sure. And so there are things there that we can do to take advantage of our state, you know, uh, I remember people often talk about natural resources, you know, and uh, 
over time our country developed based on what states had certain natural resources our best resource in new hampshire is our people oh sure and so if we can help people get a good education mm. go to school without getting crushed by debt mm. then the businesses are going to come here because they'll have good workers who can help them grow and of course you've got the drug crisis which is taking over the headlines now and yeah i mean when i was in school we used to hear about marijuana uh Sometimes we'd hear a little bit about heroin or cocaine, but it wasn't the front page. Now, all of a sudden, it's really taken a hold, and people are dying every day, I yes. guess, overdose. Every day. Yeah. You know, so I'm not sure what the answer is there, whether how, how to really combat. I mean, they're getting this stuff somewhere. Yeah. You know, whether, whether you have more police in the schools or what, I don't know. You know, I think it's more than that. I think um, there's a huge crisis with heroin and fentanyl. Mm. Uh, and we have to focus on prevention and treatment and mm. recovery. Yep. All three. Yeah. We don't have enough treatment beds no. in New Hampshire. We're one of the lowest states in the country. If you if you have a problem with drugs and you're trying to get clean and you want treatment, mm. you've got a longer line to stand in in New Hampshire than almost any other place. Oh, yeah. And we've got to fix that. But prevention really is the most important. We will never arrest our way out of the drug crisis. No. Uh, I mean, we need to be uh, tough and uh, severe with those who are dealing, especially those who are traveling to our state to deal. Mm. Um, but we're never going to arrest our way out of this. Once people are addicted, it's a disease. They, you know, they have a is. disease. Oh, yeah. A and so I think we need to do to do more education in schools. We need to do more uh helping the medical community find ways to be more careful about how they prescribe painkillers, narcotic painkillers. Uh, and there's some in the medical community who are doing a good job being leaders on that and saying, let's be very careful because uh, it might be the prescription makes sense, but then if it gets in a medicine cabinet at home and there are 60 days worth of pills and it gets stolen or sold on the street, that's one more person that's going to be hooked on heroin. So mm. uh, I think we have to be, you know, and there's also... We don't talk enough about this side of it, but prevention doesn't just start with having someone not take drugs in the first place. A huge number of people who are suffering from addiction in our state have either mental health issues or they were abused. Mm. And the more we can do to combat uh, domestic violence and sexual abuse and, yep. uh, you know, a lot of folks, they have horrible, horrible experiences young in life and drugs are one of the only things that allows them to escape. And that's wrong and we need to help them have better pathways, but we also need to try to stop that in the first place. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot to do. I wish I could tell you there, here's the silver bullet. If we, oh, I know. if we do this, it's, it's fixed. Mm. It's going to take a lot more than that. Oh, of course it is. Um, but it's important. It's an emergency and we need to do all of those things. Are there many plans and been talked about at the council or whatever about expanding some facilities to have for recovery like that mm -hmm. or beds at all? I mean, yes. the state hospital, I mean, was supposed to open up 10 beds or whatever, a unit up there, but what about up to Dartmouth or up to uh, up the northern sector? I mean, is there any other place that's being looked at? There are. There's a, a facility in the North Country I was talking to Jeff Woodburn about today that's uh, that they're looking at opening up for treatment beds. There's a new place in Manchester that's opening up for recovery. So um, this hope for New Hampshire uh, focuses less on treating someone who's going through the addiction, but it's more once they're once they've gotten clean, it doesn't end. Mm. You, oh, you're yeah. in recovery for a long, long time, and you need other people who've been through there with you, sure. peer-based counseling. Mm. I, I remember I met a waitress in Winchester. Uh, we were talking about Winchester earlier, mm. a little town outside of Keene. Oh, yeah. And she told me she spends her Saturdays at the Cheshire County Jail counseling other women what life without heroin is like. Oh, yeah. At the time, she was 10 months sober herself. She's less than a year out of being yeah. addicted to heroin. Yeah. And she's spending her weekends helping other women mm. know what it's like to get past it. And what she told me is that, you know, uh, you don't have to be an expert in this if you've been sober for two days you know how to help someone who's on their first day of sobriety mm. because you just went through it yesterday oh yeah sure and it doesn't mean that's the only help that you need but it's part of it so i believe that the people in new hampshire 
are pulling together to deal with this. The best part about this is I, I'm an optimist. I look for the silver lining. Yep. And the truth is that when think about someone, so we've all had someone we know who's in our family or a friend who's been suffering from addiction. The first thing you have to deal with is denial. Hmm. And it's hard. It's hard to break through denial. But oh, once yeah. that's that you cannot start fixing it until you're through that. Yeah. Well, that's true for us as a state too. Uh, we only this past year have gotten through our denial about the fact that we have a drug crisis. Yeah. And I don't think anyone's denying it anymore. You go ask people on the street, everyone recognizes we have an emergency. Sure. sure. Uh, so I think we've made it through the first step. But now we have, just like when somebody's suffering, you have to have them surrounded by support. That's what we have to do in the state. We have to have prevention and treatment and recovery and just surround the problem with support. I'll tell you, it is tough. It really is tough. It is. And I know the kids are going through peer pressure in schools, and that's another thing. I mean, there's bullying and all that. It's really a tough time. Yeah. You know, this is a great state, but we still have big challenges. Oh, yes. I mean, you look at where we are relative to almost any other place in the country. Uh, our unemployment's lower. Yeah. Our so. schools test at higher levels. Our communities are <clears throat> cleaner and more beautiful. We have some of the best quality of life in the country. But we also have big challenges ahead of us. And we can't sit back and say, oh, things are so great in New Hampshire. We got a lot of work to do also. Oh, yes, we, yes, we do. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, one of the reasons I'm passionate about my job as an executive counselor, about my campaign for governor, is, uh, you know, I love this state. I moved here for a job and I fell in love. I fell in love with my wife. I fell in love with New Hampshire. And I love this state with the fierce passion of an adopted son. And that's going to drive me every single day. Uh, and I'm not going to rest as long as there's more to do in our state for the people in New Hampshire. Well, I am I know talking to you now more than I have in the past, I can see how passionate you are. And also, too, a, a, quali a quality that you have, and, I'm, and I, again, I'm seeing more of it today than I've ever seen, is that you are committed to the people. And not just those who have their up here, <laughs> but the ones who are down here. You know, yeah. You've got to be open to everybody. Yeah. And like I said, uh, I've, I, I, to this day, I still hold John Lynch in high esteem. Yeah. Because his door was always open. Yeah. You didn't have to go through six people to get to him. And that's what, you're, what I'm seeing at the State House today. Mm -hmm. You can't get to there because you've got to go through six different people in hopes of even getting to the first one. You know, it's sad. And John was always, always made time for you. And uh, he, I don't care where you were, whether it was a supermarket or whatever, he was there. Yeah. And he always spoke. Never, never once slighted anybody. And I can see your, your compassion you're coming out with, and it's good. Well, those are big shoes to fill. I mean, he was an incredibly popular governor yeah. who did a lot of good by a lot of people. Uh, and we've had some good governors in New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we don't always get it right, but usually no. we do. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I do feel like there are big shoes to fill there. Mm. Uh, but I also know that, uh, you know, we, there are a lot of challenges that we're facing, and it's good to have, uh, you know, a fresh point of view, and uh, we all bring our own experiences into this. I my background is probably a little closer to John's than it is Maggie Hassan. I think both mm -hmm. are great governors, but uh, like John, I worked in business yeah. uh, and I didn't serve in the legislature. So, mm. you know, that's a, a unique job being a state senator. You kind of work on coalition building oh, yeah. and uh, that sort of thing. It's an important job, but we each approach this differently. And I like your view, as I know you and I agree on the passenger rail. I mean, others dismiss it but i think we need passenger rail back here yes i um, i know that it will help our businesses grow and i know that both because i've helped lead businesses like that who need it i have talked with business leaders who mm. are asking for it and we've looked on deep reports that show it'll help us grow jobs i know there was a big confusion sadly at this meeting about the four million dollars that got took out because they said, well, gee, we've done studies. Why do you need that yeah. again? And I said, well, it's federal money from what I understand. Yes. So it's not coming out of state funds. But I said, the trouble is, is some of these tracks are in such tough shape. If they want to bring high-speed rail in here, they can't do it. 
Yeah, I mean, the, we've already done the feasibility study. Yeah. What, does this make sense or not? Yeah. But you still need to drop the blueprints. Yeah. You still need to uh, file the environmental permits. Mm. You still need to come up with the detailed financing package. Mm. Uh, and those are the thing. That's the project development phase. That's the first step. Yeah. We have a state commissioner of transportation who came up with a way for us to do it without spending any state dollars. Yeah. Uh, just tap into money that's available from Washington. Our own taxes that we already paid. We just yeah. need to get it back to work for us. I know. And I was really disappointed. It very narrowly failed. Yeah. And I believe that we will get it done. I just, it might take an election to do it. I know because it's sad because, you know, I know Nashua wants it bad. Manchester wants oh, yeah. it. Merrimack wants a station down there. Yeah. You know, and hopefully Concord, but Concord's been kind of quiet, but they, I uh, hope to see it come up here. But I know the North Country, the other day at this meeting, they were concerned because up in Colbrook, Pittsburgh area, they were wondering what's going to happen up there. They wanted to see the train come from, I guess, Montreal oh, yeah. down through to Boston or whatever, or over to Portland. Yeah, I've heard about that. I haven't studied it closely. And from what I understood was Maine Central was going to do that, but I don't know. But they said they really want to train up there. Yeah. Because, you know, it's a big it's a big thing. You know, we're still a small state. And oh, yeah? If you grow jobs in Manchester, mm -hmm. it helps in Concord. Sure. Uh, if you, you know, open up a new business in Nashua, mm -hmm. well, there are going to be people in Keene who... Are there customers or suppliers or yeah. employees or mm. partners? Uh, you know, we're not so diff big that we need to be pitting parts of the state against no, each other. No, it's true. Well, we're coming to a close of around town. We've been sitting here talking with Executive Councilor Colin Van Ostern, who is a, a Democrat candidate for the office of governor, and we'll be seeing Colin on here again. I want to get him on here at least a couple more times before September. And if you have any questions at all, give him a call or contact him on his website. Yep. What is it again? Just like my last name, vanostern.com. Uh, vanostern.com. So by all means, give him a call and ask his questions because he needs your support. Yep. So, with that in mind, thank you to my director, Ian Max, and uh, have a great day, great weekend, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon on Around Town. I'm your host, Dick Patton.